Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jared Rand, and welcome to the Global Guided Meditation Call for Thursday, June 1, 2023, a little after 3.15 p.m. Eastern. We'll be having a reverse aging health call tomorrow night around 9 p.m. Eastern. Man's chief delusion is his conviction that there are causes other than his own state of consciousness. All that befalls a man, all that is done by him, all that comes from him, happens as a result of his state of consciousness. A man's consciousness is all that he thinks and desires and loves. All that he believes is true and consents to. That is why a change of consciousness is necessary before you can change your outer world. Now we'll got it. Now this is something that is, you know, when we, it's understanding, it's the whole gambit of who and what we are. See, we've never had that opportunity as a civilization. We've been programmed, again, in different ways, you know, not direct and indirectly. First thing to realize is that whether you want or not, you are alone. Aloneness is our very nature. You can try to forget it. You can try not to be alone by making friends, having lovers, mixing in the crowd. But whatever you do remains just on the surface. Deep inside, your aloneness is unreachable, untouchable. A strange accident happens to every human being. As they are born, the very situation of their birth begins in a family in most cases. And there is no other way because the human child is the weakest child in the whole of existence. The human child is the weakest child in the whole of existence. Other animals are born complete. A dog is going to remain a dog his whole life. He is not going to evolve, grow. Yes, he will become aged, old, but he will not become more intelligent. He will not become more aware. He will not become enlightened. And in that sense, all the animals remain exactly at the point of their birth. Nothing essential changes in them. Their death and their birth are horizontal in one line. Only man has the possibility of going vertical, upward, not just horizontal. Most of humanity behaves like other animals. Life is just growing old, not growing up. Growing up and growing old are totally different experiences. Growing up and growing old are totally different experiences. Man is born in a family among human beings. From the very first moment, he is not alone. Hence, he gets a certain psychology of always remaining with people. In aloneness, he starts feeling scared, unknown fears. He's not exactly aware of what he is afraid of. But as he moves out of the crowd, something inside him becomes uneasy. To be with others, he feels cozy, at ease, comfortable. It is because of this reason he never comes to know the beauty of aloneness. The fear prevents him. Because he was born in a group, he remains part of a group. And as he grows in age, he starts making new groups, new associations, new friends, already existing collectivities don't satisfy him. The nation, the religion, the political party, he creates his own new associations, whatever they may be, Rotary Club, Lions Club, but all these strategies are just in service of one thing, Never to be alone. The whole, this, the whole life experience of being together with people 
Aloneness seems almost like a death. In a way, it is a death. It is the death of the personality that you have created in the crowd. This is a gift of others to you. The moment you move out of the crowd, you, are, you also move out of your personality. In the crowd, you know exactly who you are. You know your name. You know your degrees. You know your profession. You know everything that is needed for your passport, your identity card. But the moment you move out of the crowd, what is your identity? Who are you? Suddenly you become aware that you are not your name. Your name was given to you. You are not your race. What relationship has race with your consciousness? What relationship has race with your consciousness? Your heart is not Hindu or Mohammedan. Your being is not confined to any political boundaries of a nation. Your consciousness is not part of any organization or church. Who are you? Suddenly, your personality starts dispersing. This is the fear, the death of the personality. Now, you will have to discover freshly. You will have to choose you will have to start meditating on the question, who am I? And there is a fear that you may not be at all. Perhaps you were nothing but a combination of all the opinions of the crowd that you were nothing but your personality. Nobody cares to be nothing. Nobody wants to be nobody. In fact, everybody is a nobody. There is a very beautiful story, right? Alice has reached Wonderland. She came to meet the king, and the king asked, Alice, did you meet a messenger coming toward me? She said, I met nobody. The king said, if you met nobody, why has he not arrived yet? Alice was very much puzzled, she said. She said, you are not understanding me rightly. Nobody is nobody. The king said, that is obvious that nobody is nobody. But where is he? He should have reached here by this time. It simply means nobody walks slower than you. And naturally, Alice was very much annoyed and forgot that she was talking to the king. She said, nobody walks faster than me. Now the whole conversation goes on with that nobody. She understands that he is saying, nobody walks slower than you, and I am a fast walker. I have come from the other world to Wonderland, a small world, and he is insulting me. Naturally, she re retorts, nobody walks faster than me. King said, that is right, then why has he not arrived? And this way, the discussion continues. Everybody is a nobody. So the first problem for a seeker is to understand exactly the nature of the aloneness. It means nobodiness. It means dropping your personality, which is a gift to you from the crowd. As you move away out of the crowd, you cannot take that gift with you in your aloneness. In your aloneness, you will have to discover again, fresh and nobody can guarantee whether you will find anybody inside or not. Those who have reached to aloneness have found nobody there. I really mean nobody, no name, no form, but a pure presence, a pure life, nameless, formless. This is exactly the true resurrection, and it certainly needs courage. Only very courageous people have been able to accept with joy their nobodiness, their nothingness. Their nothingness is their pure being. It is a death and a resurrection both. Having just God 
for his whole life, he was very happy proclaiming, I am the only begotten son of God. We're talking about Jesus, right? And he never talked about gods. He never, at least that anybody knows of, never talked about family, his brother, his wife, his other sons and daughters. In the whole of eternity, what has God been doing? He does not have a TV to waste time, to pass time. He does not have any possibility of having a movie hall. What does this poor fellow go on doing? It is well known, it's a well-known fact, that in poor countries the population goes on exploding for the simple reason that the poor man has no other free entertainment. The only free entertainment is to produce children. Although it is in the long run very costly, right now there is no ticket, no problem, no standing in the queue. What has God been doing for the whole of eternity? He has created only one son. Now on the cross, Jesus realizes that he would have been better if God had a few brothers, sisters, uncles. I could have asked help from somebody else if he is not listening to me. He is praying and he is angry, saying, why have you forgotten me? Have you given up on me? But there is no answer. He's waiting for the miracle. The whole crowd that has gathered to see the miracle, by and by, starts dispersing. It is too hot, and they are waiting unnecessarily. Nothing is going to happen. If something were going to happen, it would have happened. After six hours there were only three ladies left who still believed that a miracle might happen. One was Jesus' mother, naturally. Mothers go on believing that their children are geniuses. Every mother, without exception, believes that she has given birth to a child who is a giant. Another woman who loved Jesus was a prostitute, Mary Magdalene. That woman also although she was a prostitute, must have loved Jesus. Even the disciples, the so-called apostles, who became second to Jesus in importance in the history of Christianity, all 12 escaped just out of fear of being caught and of being recognized because they were always hanging around with Jesus everywhere. You never can trust the crowd. If they were caught, they might have been crucified if not crucified, at least beaten, stoned to death. Only three women were left. The third was another woman who loved Jesus. It was love that remained in the last moments, in the form of these three women. All those disciples must have been with Jesus just in order to get into paradise. It is always good to have good contacts. And you can't find better contact than the only begotten Son of God. Just behind him, they w- there would also be they would also be able to enter through the gates of paradise. Their disciplehood was a kind of exploitation of Jesus. Hence, there was no courage. It was cunning and clever, but not courageous. Only love can be courageous. Do you love yourself? Do you love this existence? Do you love this beautiful life, which is a gift? And it has been given to you without your being even ready for it without your deserving it, without your being worthy of it. If you love this existence, which has given life to you, which goes on providing every moment life and nourishment to you, you will find courage. And this courage will help you to stand alone like a cedar of Lebanon 
high, reaching to the stars, but alone. And aloneness, you will disappear as an ego and a personality. You will find yourself as life itself, deathless and eternal. Unless you are capable of being alone, your search for truth will remain a failure. Your aloneness is your truth. Your aloneness is your divineness function of a master is to help you to stand alone. Meditation is just a strategy to take away your personality, your thoughts, your mind, your identity with the body and leave you absolutely along, alone inside just a living fire. And once you have found your living fire, you will know all the toys and all the ecstasies that human consciousness is capable of. The old woman watched her grandson eat his soup with the wrong spoon, grasp his knife by the wrong end, eat the main course with his hands, pour tea into the saucer and blow on it. Hasn't watching your mother and father at the dinner table taught you anything, she asked. Yes, said the boy, chewing with his mouth open. Never to get married. He has learned a great lesson. Remain alone. It is really very difficult to be with others, but we are accustomed. It is really very difficult to be with others, but we are accustomed from our very birth to be with others. It may be miserable, it may be a suffering, it may be a torture, but we are accustomed at least. It is well known. One is afraid to step into the darkness beyond the territory. But unless you go beyond the territory of the collective mass, you cannot find yourself. Most of us remember Groucho Marx, the Marx brother. He had a beautiful statement for us to remember. Quote, I find television very educating. Every time somebody turns on the set, I go into the other room and read a book. The teacher of a class of 10-year-olds is too shy to conduct the sex education class, and so she asks her class to make this a homework project. Little Jaime asks his father, who mumbles something about a stork. His grandmother says he came from a cabbage patch. And his great-grandmother blushes and whispers that. And his grandmother says he came from a grand, a cabbage patch. And his great-grandmother blushes and whispers that Children come from the great ocean of existence. The next day, little Jaime is called by the teacher to report on his project. Jaime says to the teacher, I'm afraid there is something wrong in our family. Apparently, nobody has made love for three generations. In fact, very few people have loved it all. They have pretended, have been hypocrites, deceiving not only others, but have deceived themselves, too. You can love authentically only when you are. Right now, you are only a part of a crowd, a cog in the machine. 
How can you love? Because you are not first, be, first, know yourself. In your aloneness, you will discover what it is to be. And out of that awareness of your being, love flows, and much more. Aloneness should be your only search. And it does not mean that you have to go to the mountains. You can be alone in the marketplace. It is simply a question of being aware. Alert watchful, remembering that you are only your watchfulness. Then you are alone, wherever you are. You may be in the crowd. You may be in the mountains. It makes no difference. You are just the same watchfulness. And it does not mean that you have to go to the mountains. You can be alone in the marketplace. It is simply a question of being aware, alert, watchful, remembering that you are only your watchfulness. It does boil down to it's simply a question of being aware, alert, watchful, remembering that you are only your watchfulness. Then you are alone wherever you are. You may be in the crowd. You may be in the mountains. It makes no difference. You are just the same watchfulness. In the crowd, you watch the crowd. In the mountains, you watch the mountains. With open eyes, you watch existence. You watch existence with closed eyes. You watch yourself. You are only one thing, the watcher. And this watcher is the greatest realization. This is your Buddha nature. In other words, your enlightened nature. This is your awakening. This should be your only discipline. Only this makes you a disciple. This discipline of knowing your aloneness. Otherwise, that makes you a disciple. You have been deceived on every point in this life. You have been told that to believe in a master makes you a disciple. That is absolutely wrong. Other, otherwise, in this world, is a disciple. Everybody in this world is a disciple. Somebody believes in Jesus. Somebody believes in Buddha. Somebody believes in Krishna. Somebody believes in Mahavira. Everybody believes in somebody, but nobody in a disciple. Because to be a disciple does not mean to believe in a master. To be a disciple means to learn the discipline of being yourself, of being your true self. And that experience is hidden, the very treasure of life. And that experience you become for the first time. And that experience is hidden, the very treasure of life. In that experience, you become, for the first time, an emperor. Otherwise, you will re remain a beggar in the crowd. There are two kinds of beggars, poor beggars and rich beggars. But they are all beggars. Even your kings and your queens are beggars. Only those people, very few people, who have stood alone in their being, in their clarity, in their light, who have found their own light, who have found their own flowering, who have found their own space, they can call their home, their eternal home. Those few people are the emperors. This whole universe is their empire. They don't need to conquer it. It is already conquered. By knowing yourself, you have conquered it. And we're, we're born alone, we live alone, and we die alone, okay? Aloneness is our very nature, but we are not aware of it 
because we are not aware of it, we remain strangers to ourselves. And instead of seeing our aloneness as a tremendous beauty and bliss, silence and peace, at easeness with existence, we misunderstand it as loneliness. Loneliness is a misunderstood aloneness. Once you misunderstood your aloneness as loneliness, the whole context changes. Aloneness has a beauty and a grandeur, a positivity. Loneliness is poor, negative, dark, dismal. Loneliness is a gap. Something is missing. Something is needed to fill it. And nothing can ever fill it because it is a misunderstanding in the first place. As you grow older, the gap also grows bigger. People are so afraid to be by themselves that they do anything, any, they do any kind of stupid thing. I've seen people playing cards alone. The other party is not there. They have invented games in which the same person plays cards from both sides. Those who have known aloneness say something absolutely different. They say there is nothing more beautiful, more peaceful, more joyful than being alone. The ordinary man goes on trying to forget his loneliness. And the meditator starts getting more and more acquainted with his aloneness. He has left this world. He has gone to the caves, the mountains, to the forest, just for the sake of being alone. Now, the ordinary man goes on trying to forget his loneliness, and the meditator starts getting more and more acquainted with his loneliness. He has left the world. He has gone to the caves, to the mountains, to the forest, just for the sake of being alone. He wants to know who he is in the crowd it is difficult there are so many disturbances and those who have known their aloneness have known the greatest blissfulness possible to human beings because your very being is blissful after being in tune with your aloneness you can relate then your relationship will bring great joys to you. After being in tune with your aloneness, you can relate. Then your relationship will bring great joys to you because it is not out of fear. Finding your aloneness, you can create. You can be involved in as many things as you want because this involvement will not anymore be running away from yourself now it will be your expression now it will be the med meditations these meditations of all that is your potential But the first basic thing is to know your aloneness, absolutely. So I remind you, don't misunderstand aloneness as loneliness. Loneliness is certainly sick. Aloneness is perfect health. You first and most primary step toward finding the meaning and the significance of this life is to enter into your aloneness it is your temple it is where your god lives 
and you cannot find the truth. Find this temple. The meaning and significance of this life. It is your temple. It is where your God lives. And you cannot find this temple anywhere else. The deepest urge in man is to be totally free. Freedom, moksha, is the goal. Jesus calls it the kingdom of God. To be like kings, just symbolically, so that there is no fetter to your existence, no bondage, no boundary. You exact is infinity. Nowhere do you clash with anybody else. As if you are alone. Freedom and aloneness are two aspects of the same thing. That's why the Jaina mystic Mahavira called his concept of freedom Kaivalya. Kaivalya means to be absolutely alone as if nobody else exists. When you are absolutely alone, who will become a bondage to you when nothing else is there? That's why those who are in search of freedom will have to find their solitariness. They will have to find a way, means, method to reach their aloneness. Man is born as part of the world, as a member of a society, of a family, as part of others. He is brought up not as a solitary being. He is brought up as a social being. All training, education, culture consists of how to make a child a fitting part of the society and how to make him fit with others. This is what psychologists call adjustment. And whenever somebody is solitary, he looks maladjusted. Society exists as a network, pattern of many persons, a crowd. There, you can have a little freedom at the cost of much. If you follow the society, if you become an obedient counterpart to others, they will lease you a little world of freedom. If you become a slave, freedom is given to you. But it is a given freedom. It can be taken back. Moment, any moment. And it is at a very great cost. It is an adjustment with others. So boundaries are bound to be there. In this society, in a social existence, nobody can be absolutely free. The very existence of the other will create trouble. The other is hell. Because the other creates tensions in you. You are worried because of the other. There is going to be a clash because the other is in search of absolute freedom. You are also in search of absolute freedom. Everybody needs absolute freedom. And absolute freedom can exist only for one. Even your so-called kings are not absolutely free, cannot be. They may have an apprentice of freedom, but that is false. They have to be protected. They depend on others. Their freedom is just a facade. But still, because of the urge to be absolutely free, 
one feels a much stronger desire than ever before on this planet. One wants to become a king, an emperor. The emperor gives a false impression that he is free. One wants to become very rich because riches also give a false impression that you are free. The emperor gives a false impression that he is free. One wants to become very rich because riches also give a false impression that you are free. How can a poor man be free? His needs will be the bondage, and he cannot fulfill his needs. Everywhere he moves, he comes to a wall which he cannot cross. Hence the desire for riches. How can a poor man be free? His needs will be the bondage, and he cannot fulfill his needs. Everywhere he moves, he comes to a wall which he cannot cross. Hence the desire for richness deep down and the desire to be absolutely free, and all other desires are created by it. In old Hebrew, the word sin, in old Hebrew, the word sin is very beautiful. It means one who has missed the mark. There's no sense of guilt in it, really. A sinner means one who has missed the mark, gone astray. And religion means to come back to the right path so you don't miss the goal. The goal is, and we're not talking about man-made religion. The goal is absolute freedom. Religion is just a means toward it. That's why you have to understand that real religion exists as an anti-social force. In very nature, it's very, nature is anti-social because in society, absolute freedom is not possible. Psychology, on the other hand, is in the service of the society. The psychiatrist goes on trying in every way to make you adjust it again to the society. He is in the service of the society. Politics, of course, is in the service of the society. It gives you a little freedom so that you can be made a slave. That freedom is just a bribe. You can be taken back any moment. If you think that you are really free, soon, soon you can be thrown into prison. Politics, psychology, culture, education, they all serve society. Religion alone is basically rebellious, but the society has fooled you. It has created its own religions, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Mohammedism. There are social tricks. Jesus is antisocial. Look at Jesus. He was not a very respectable man. Could not be. He moved with wrong elements, antisocial elements. He was a vagabond. He was a freak. Had to be because he would not listen to the society and he would not become adjusted to it. He created an alternate society, a small group of followers. Ashrams have existed as antisocial forces But not all ashrams become society. Always tries to give you a false coin. If there are a hundred ashrams, then there may be one, and that, too, only perhaps, that is a real ashram. Because that one will exist as an alternative society against this society, against this nameless crowd. Schools have existed, for example, Buddhist monasteries in Bihar, which try to create a society that is not a society at all. They create ways and means to make you really and totally free, no bondage on you, no discipline of any sort, no boundaries. You are allowed to be infinite, to be 
the all. Jesus is antisocial. Buddha is antisocial. But Christianity is not antisocial. Buddhism is not antisocial. Society is very cunning. It immediately absorbs even antisocial phenomena into the social. It creates a facade. It gives you a false coin, and then you are happy, just like small children who have been given a false plastic breast, a pacifier. They go on sucking it, and they feel they are being nourished. It will soothe them. Of course, they will fall into sleep. Whenever a child is uneasy, this has to be done. A false breast has to be given. He sucks believing that he is getting nutrition. He goes on sucking, and then sucking becomes a monotonous process. Nothing is moving in, just sucking. And it becomes like a mantra. Then he falls into sleep, bored, feeling sleepy. He goes into sleep. Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, all and all other isms that have become established religions are just pacifiers. They give you consolation. They give you a good sleep. They allow a soothing existence in this torturing slavery all around. They give you a feeling that everything is okay, nothing is wrong. They are like tranquilizers. They are drugs. It is not only LSD that is a drug. Christianity is also. And a far more complex and subtle drug, which gives you a sort of blindness. You cannot see what is happening. You cannot feel how you are waiting when wasting your life. You cannot see the dis-ease that you have accumulated through many existences. You're sitting on a volcano. And they go on saying that everything is okay. God in heaven and government on the earth. Everything is okay. And so the, and the priests go on saying to you, you need not be disturbed. We are here. Simply leave everything in our hands, and we will take care of you in this world and in the other also. And you have left it to them. And that's why you are in misery. Society, this society, currently in this now, cannot give you freedom. It is impossible because society cannot manage to make everybody absolutely free. Then what to do? How to go beyond society? That's the question for a religious person. But it seems impossible. Wherever you move, society is there. You can move from one society to another, but society will be there. You can even go to the Himalayas. Then you will create a society there. You will start talking with the trees because it is so difficult to be alone. You will start making friends with the birds and animals. And sooner or later, there will be a family. You will wait every day for the bird who comes in the morning and sings. Now, you don't understand that you have become dependent. The other has entered. If the bird doesn't come, you will feel a certain anxiety. What has happened to the bird? Why has he not come? Tension enters. This is not in any way different from when you were worried about your wife or worried about your child. This is not in any way different. It is the same pattern, the other. Even if you move to the Himalayas, you create society. Something has to be understood. Society is not outside of you. It is something within you. And unless the root causes within you disappear, Wherever you go, the society will come into existence again and again and again, become a social force. If you go to an ashram, society will come in. It is not the society that follows you. It is you. You always create your society around you. 
you are a creator. Something in you exists as a seed which creates the society. This shows me really that unless you are transformed completely, you can never go beyond society. You will always create your own society. And all societies are the same. The forms may differ, but the basic pattern is the same. Why can't you live without society? There is the rub. Even in the Himalayas, you will wait for somebody. You must be sitting under a tree, and you will wait for someone, a traveler, a hunter, who passes by on the road. And if somebody comes by, you will feel a little happiness coming to you. Alone, you become sad. And if a hunter comes to you, and a hunter will gossip, you will ask, what is happening in the world? Have you got the latest newspaper? Or give me news. I am hungry and thirsty for it. Why? Roots have to be brought up into the light so that you can understand. One thing you need to be needed, you have a deep need to be needed. If nobody needs you, you feel useless, meaningless. If somebody needs you, he gave you significance. You feel important. You go on saying, I have to look after the wife and the children, as if you are carrying them as a burden. You were wrong. You talk as if it is a great responsibility, and you are just fulfilling a duty. You are wrong. Just think if the wife is not there and the children have disappeared. What will you do? Suddenly, you will feel your life has become meaningless because they needed you. Some children, they waited for you. They gave you significance. You were important. Now that nobody needs you, you will shrink. Because when nobody needs you, nobody pays attention to you. Whether you are or not makes no difference. The whole of psychoanalysis and its business depends just on listening. There's nothing much. There's really nothing much in psychoanalysis. And the whole thing around it is almost complete hocus pocus. But why does it go on? A man pays you so much attention and not an ordinary man, a famous psychiatrist, well-known, who has written many books. He has treated many well-known people. So you feel good. Nobody else listens to you, not even your wife or your husband. Nobody listens to you. Nobody pays any attention to you. You move in the world as a non-entity, a nobody, and you pay so much to a psychiatrist. It is a luxury. Only very rich people can afford it. But why do they do what they do? They simply lie down on a couch and talk. And the psychoanalysis listen, analyst listens. But he listens. He pays attention to you. Of course, you have to pay. You have to pay for it. But you feel good simply because the other is paying attention. You feel good. You walk differently out of his office. Your quality has changed. You have a dance in your feet. You can hum. You can sing. may not be forever. Next week, you will have to come again to his office. But when somebody listens to you, pays attention to you, he is saying, you are somebody. You are worth listening to. He doesn't seem bored. He may not say anything, but even so, it is very good. You have a deep need to be needed. Somebody must need you. Otherwise, you don't have any ground under your feet. Society is your need. Even if somebody fights with you, it is okay, better than being alone, because at least he pays attention to you. The enemy, you can think about him. Whenever you are in love, look at this need. Look at lovers. Watch, because it will be difficult for you yourself are in love. Then to watch is difficult because you are almost crazy. You are not in your senses. 
But watch lovers. They say to each other, I love you. But deep down in their hearts, they want to be loved. To love is not the thing to be loved is the real thing. To be loved is the real thing. And they love just in order to be loved. The basic thing is not to love. The basic thing is to be loved. That's why lovers go on complaining against each other. You don't love me enough. Nothing is enough. Nothing can ever be enough because the need is infinite. Hence, the bondage is infinite. Whatsoever the lover is doing, you will always feel something more is possible. You can still hope more. You can still imagine more. And then that is lacking. And then you feel frustrated. And every lover thinks, I love but the other is not responding well. And the other thinks in the same terms. What is the matter? Nobody loves. And unless you become a Jesus or a Buddha, an enlightened one, you cannot love. Because only one whose need to be needed has disappeared can love. Only one whose need to be needed has disappeared can love. I'll join you in the meditation. I'll return to close this out.
take an easy and slow breath in from the nose. And take an easy and slow breath out from the mouth. Remain still. Dive all the way in. Explore going down to the bottom of your deepest, darkest trench and muck inside. There you will discover that which will lead you deeper to your core. Just for five minutes sometime today, hang out with your dark stuff. Get to know it. Get to know its vibration. Being with the contracted parts of yourself assists you in knowing what it is you are to transcend. Take this with you for the rest of the day into the evening and night and the following morning. And we will return here Friday, June 2nd, 2023, 3.15 p.m. Eastern to continue our global guided meditation call and 9 p.m. Eastern to continue our reverse aging health call. Be gentle, kind, generous, and humble with yourself at all times and be in the highest of deepest, deepest, deepest eternal gratitude at all times. Be amazed on transformation, no matter what's going on around you.